crazy look at that isn't that amazing it's totally such a trip it's like an endless recursion we're going to the end of the universe that's how deep it goes down the rabbit hole do you, is four minutes not enough time to talk is it four minutes before we're supposed to start okay. uh, no 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 this will be th th I mean the work session might not end I'll probably talk for like 30 minutes and it'll be like a conversation. It's actually already recording right now. So. <laughs> so if anyone does not want to be broadcast to the world, stop talking now. Because <laughs> everything we say from here on out will be broadcast to the world. Yeah, we should. Um, let's connect. Let's connect early. Let's let's. Exchange emails like early next week. Uh, this weekend's gonna be crazy because the cause is uh, Sunday and Monday. Everyone's gonna be sad. I don't think it's like. Uh, is there a vigil this weekend too? Yeah. Is it a surprise or? Okay. Yeah, no, take it. All right, so we got three minutes and then we're gonna start. Just FYI, everything you're saying is being recorded. You okay with that? Because this will go on YouTube and it'll be public to the world forever. So don't share any deep dark secrets about all the people you've eaten or murdered. Brian didn't murder anyone. I promise. I don't think he did. Did he? I don't know. Doesn't look like you're murdered. Man. You're not a serial killer, are you? You're out. Get out. Leave the room. No, stop. Yeah, I actually used to hurt bugs too when I was a kid. It's terrible. I don't know. What's wrong with people? So, my parents, like, I think the liberation pledge is really valuable because it just sort of shows that you mean what you say, you know, that you think that not eating animals isn't a personal choice, it's a norm and a commitment to making a better world that, you know, you'd like to extend to everyone around you. So, yeah, I think the liberation pledge is the most important thing, but practicing the liberation pledge isn't like a positive, you know, loving way is, is the trick. It's, it's hard to do, but it can be done. Uh, I mean, it took me a long time, and I tried almost everything. Like, I got into huge arguments. I threw animal products away in my parents' house. I mean, I did all sorts of things. But the mo most important thing was just the fact that I, you know, very strongly felt and expressed to them that, that I felt that people should not eat animals, and no one, not just me, but I don't think anybody should be taking another being's body and consuming it. it just, Seems like a basic violation of that being's autonomy and their rights. Sometimes just saying that over and over again is what works. Okay, I'm gonna start this. Everyone's okay. Is anyone actually on the live stream? We have three viewers. So somebody's online. Hello, people are online. Um, hey, folks, I'm gonna start the video editing hack session, if that's all right. If anyone wants to join in and listen in at all, 
Um, I am live streaming this, so if we could keep the noise like reasonable, I mean, soft conversations would be okay. But we have at least three viewers on YouTube now, and maybe more people will join. A lot of people in the network said they did want to hear about video editing. Um, so what I am going to do, folks, for folks online, is I'm going to share a little checklist that I made for myself on the event page. And then I'm going to start talking about video editing. Um, is anyone actually interested in this in the room? Is anyone here li to, intending to listen to this? You would like to listen? Right here. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah, I'll try and keep this short and sweet and then just walk people through a video and then people can just work on their own videos. <laughs> but, um, you know, DXC, basically everything we do is based on templates and best practices. We try and figure out, like, what the best way to do something is and then share it with as many people as we can and then refine that best practice over time as more people give us feedback. And we've talked a lot about video editing with people, professional video editors at HSUS, at PETA. We have a conversation with the producer of The Walking Dead that's being scheduled sometime in the next few weeks. Um, and some of the things we learned are in this checklist. And I'll just briefly go through this checklist, and then I'm going to walk people through a video that I made recently um, from our Lily campaign that has been seen by almost a million people now. Um, I think it's like almost 900,000. So uh, the reason for a checklist is it just kind of reminds you of what the key things to do are. And it's surprising how often if you don't have a checklist, you forget even really important things. And the story I always tell you people about checklists is there was a study done of, of surgeons, like you know, medical surgery in hospitals, finding that in the surgeons, you might think, oh, these are really smart people. They've been doing it for decades. They get trained for like 10 years before they're actually allowed to operate on people independently. So these are the last people who need something as simple as a checklist. But it turns out that surgeries, surgeons who were forced to use checklists, and there were some hospitals, they actually did what's called a randomized controlled trial, and they forced some hospitals to use checklists in surgery, and other hospitals were not using checklists, and it reduced the fatality and major complication rate, I think, by like a third. So like, and that's thousands and thousands of people are not dead because they did something as simple as just having a checklist. So even like really smart, professional people needed to use something as simple as a checklist to ensure they did things well. And, and video is, you know, complicated. It's hard. And there's a lot of different pieces to it to make it good. So I think reviewing a checklist is often useful for this purpose. Um, the checklist we have is split into three pieces, kind of review and preparation, what you do before you start editing the video, editing itself, and then releasing the video. And this is a work in progress, this checklist. We'll probably make add additions to it, but I'll just briefly go through all these. The first thing you need to do when you're editing a video is assign on a concept. Um, just a one-sentence summary of what the video is. And one sentence is really important because when you deliver this video to the world, it's going to have a caption and a thumbnail. And that caption and thumbnail have to be interesting enough that someone actually wants to watch it on that basis alone. So whenever anyone's editing a video, including Aterit, and Aterit and I have these conversations all the time. Aterit's mom is actually here with us. But whenever Aterit and I have a conversation about video, um, the first thing we say is, like, what's our one sentence? What's our bullet point pitch? Like, what is the caption going to be on Facebook? And what is the thumbnail? What is that visual imagery? that's going to draw someone in and justify clicking on the video. Um, and and the, the rule of thumb you should use in deciding on the one sentence should be is what Jonah Berger, a organizational and cognitive psychologist at the University of Pennsylvania, calls steps. And this is six steps to viral content. And I'm not going to go through all these steps um, today, but you, you should go back and read this article. And if you see this checklist, it actually links to an article that talks about steps. There's also a really great book by Jonah Berger that's called Contagious. Um, but the six steps are one, social currency. So people will tend to watch stuff and share stuff that makes them feel awesome, that makes them feel cool. So um, you know, a video about how vegans are going to live a 1,000 years because they're healthier than everyone else. A video about how animal rights activists in DXC um, achieved a groundbreaking victory in Berkeley. A video about how SeaWorld gave up orcas and released all the orcas of the wild because of the incredible work that animal rights activists have been doing around the world. All this stuff builds social currency. It makes people feel awesome. They want to brag about it. It's like a badge of honor. So if you're making something that creates social currency, there's a good chance it'll go viral. Triggers is a little harder, but the idea behind a trigger is something that's already in the zeitgeist and on top of people's mind. And one of the examples that um, Jonah Berger used, used this in his book is Kit Kats. So there is a coffee company that was a new coffee company, and they wanted to try and get their brand out. And sure how they could get you know the word out about this new type of coffee and they linked their branding and their marketing up with Kit Kats and they did this weird thing where like um, they did this viral marketing campaign where 
every time you had a Kit Kat, you're supposed to drink this coffee. And because Kit Kats are like a known thing and people see Kit Kats every time they go to the grocery store, Kit Kats independently are being marketed. They're just a very popular type of chocolate. Unfortunately, not vegan. So eventually, hopefully, we'll have vegan Kit Kats. So the example is more resonant with us as animal rights activists. But it actually went viral because every time someone saw a Kit Kat, they thought of this new coffee. And so people started buying this coffee. And similarly, anytime something's just out there in the world a lot, so you know whether it's Occupy Wall Street or viral memes about Donald Trump or, or the, the Ice Bucket Challenge a few years ago, anything that's already big and you're seeing hashtag on Facebook already, if you can jump back on that trigger, there's a good chance your content will viral too. Um, emotion. So emotion is really powerful, and um, in particular, you want active emotions. So emotions like sadness and depression are not good emotions because sadness actually makes people inactive. They withdraw and they don't want to do anything. Um, and positive emotions tend to be better than negative emotions. It doesn't mean you shouldn't use negative emotions. But the negative emotions that are effective for social media and video production purposes are active emotions like anger. Like anger is probably one of the most powerful emotions. And if you create a video that makes people angry, when people are angry, they want to act. They want to do something. They want to fight, right? And so triggering anger in some way is effective. Anxiety, interestingly, is also a very effective emotion. There's a lot of evidence showing that when people are anxious, they also take action. Because anxiety literally is like you're stressed out and you feel like I need to do something. So, you know, you probably have seen, like, a lot of these are conspiracy theories, but like some article about how, you know, milk is, is making you infertile or something like that. that. That creates anxiety in people. When they see an article like that, they want to share it. They want to talk about it. They want to figure out what's actually going on. Because if, if milk is going to make me infertile, then I have to figure out what's going on. You know, that's scary. Um, the positive emotions are usually better on average than the negative emotions. And the active positive emotions we should be searching, searching for are things like inspiration. Like if I'm fired up and I feel like literally like I'm going to go do something. I mean literally inspiration is the most active emotion because the definition of inspiration is it's the emotion that causes you to act. Like you're inspired when you decide to do something as a result of the emotion that's running through your mind. Um, other very powerful emotions are awe when you're just blown away by someone else's accomplishment. So, you know, a lot of people share John's video of sitting in front of a slaughterhouse truck because they're just like, oh my gosh, like that's amazing. I've never seen like something like this. I've seen so many vigils, so many photographs of vigils and people bearing witness. I've never seen someone or very infrequently see someone willing to put their body on the line to block a slaughterhouse truck and that's awe-inspiring. Hilarity is also really good emotion. So all of us have told good jokes or heard good jokes or seen a funny movie and we always want to share those gifts or those memes or those JPEGs because they're hilarious, right? So searching for an emotion that's active will trigger your content and your video being viral. Um, public is less useful for video footage, but in general, um, the, the, the idea behind public is anytime you're creating content that other people can display in a public way, um, you potentially can make your content go viral. So an example of this is the logo of the Apple icon. So Apple makes all of its product very prominently display the Apple icon in a very public way um, because they want other people to see it and they want and the same thing is true of a lot of other viral marketing campaigns where you know, they give you some badge or a ribbon or a t-shirt or something that you can publicly display. Like Chipotle does this very well where they give out lots of swag and they try and encourage you to display something publicly. Stuff that's private is less interesting. So you know, giving someone a book that they'll read in the privacy of their home is less likely to go viral than giving someone a badge or something you can display publicly. Um, practical value. Um, so this is obviously you know, something that we share all the time too. But you know, I do this all the time with good deals. Like, if I see a good deal on slick deals, like you know, you can get a cheap, um, cheap vegan cookies from some website, or you know, new bike tires, or something that are and it's a steal. Like that's practically valuable to me, and I'm gonna want to share it to other people. And we see this all the time uh, on viral content too. Maybe there's like a really cool recipe or an opportunity, like a new vegan option at Burger King. It has some practical value to the people who are our friends and our family members, so we're more likely to share it. And finally, storytelling. And storytelling is actually probably the most powerful because. Frankly, for 250,000 years of human history, storytelling has been part of the reasons we even have human language. When you hear a good story, you just want to share it, right? And all of us have probably like read a book or watched a movie or, or, or even just like seen a short viral video that had a really good story. And when you're, when you're drawn into a really good story, it's almost like that story becomes your story. You feel like you're part of that story and you want to share it with everyone. Okay. So every single one of your videos, you should have a one sentence summary of that video that you can explain to someone and that instantly will make them interested. That doesn't mean it has to be exhaustive, right? It doesn't have to represent everything that's in your video because your video is going to be like one and a half, two minutes, maybe even 30 minutes if you're making a longer form piece. But you should be able to distill it into one sentence that's very concise and simple and that involves at least one step of steps, right? One of these six things should be included in your video. And if it doesn't include one of those six things, then you're probably doing it wrong. 
Okay, next step, you've got a concept, then you go get some footage. This could be footage that you get from the internet, it could be footage that you shot yourself, it could be footage that someone else has given you, but what we usually do is create a file of key clips. You go through all the video footage that you have, you cut it down to shorter clips that you think potentially would be useful for a video, and just get kind of a mem mental recollection of everything you've seen. Um, important types of content, there's a link here to various types of important content that are relevant for animal rights activists. All these types of content, and this is not an exhaustive list, we'll probably add to this list in the video production team, and there's some folks sitting at the table here who are part of the video production team. One of the things we're doing in video production is not just making great videos, but hopefully developing more knowledge and creating best practices so we can share it with other animal rights activists. But some of the things that we learn from experience and from evidence are really useful are things like animals engaging in unique types of behavior or interaction, um, animals and humans showing emotion for each other, Trans species interaction, probably all of us have seen like videos of like dogs and piglets that go viral or you know a chicken and a person, you know that sort of thing. Animals expressing resistance or desire to escape. So like every time a cow breaks out of a slaughterhouse or a pig jumps out of a slaughter truck, that always goes viral. Humans rescuing animals. So you know like, especially if it's unexpected human, like you know the hunter who like comes to his senses and decides he doesn't actually want to shoot the deer but sees a deer trapped in a, in a gate or a fence or something like that and tries to help them out. Animals expressing in, in individual unique characteristics, like you know, a cow who's just really obsessed with playing a ball, you know, like just something that really shows that animal's individuality. And then animals expressing other emotions in obvious ways, like an animal crying, an animal uh, laughing, an animal joyous, an animal anxious, an animal scared. Any of these like obvious, visually evident emotions will cause your content to go viral. So you should be looking for those sorts of content when you're going through key clips. Oops, I just deleted my. Okay, the next thing is you've got a concept, you've got a bunch of video footage. Um, the suggestion I give is not all videos have an audio track, but if you are going to use an audio track, an audio track is often very useful. It's not necessary because on social media at least, recognize that about 70 to 80% of your audience is not going to use audio. Now granted, the 20 to 30% that does listen to your video is really important because that's the percentage of your audience that's going to share it, right? And so if the content actually goes viral, it's going to be because the 20 to 30% who really likes the video and clicks on the play button and listens to the audio, likes it enough to share it. So the audio is really important, but recognize that there's a good portion of your audience that's not going to use audio. But if you are going to use audio, um, pick an audio track. Um, if it's for Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, it should be less than two minutes. Frankly, the tendency is to get shorter and shorter. So if you look at a lot of the viral content in BuzzFeed or Upworthy, a lot of this stuff is like 30 seconds to a minute. It's not even two minutes, so two minutes is cutting it. If you're talking about three, four, five minutes, that's really bad. Um, and doesn't say, doesn't mean you can't do that. Like there are videos that go viral that are five, six, seven, eight, even 10 minute videos on Facebook, but it's very uncommon. Um, Cause people's attention spans are super short. A lot of people are watching on mobile and just like screaming across on their smartphones a video. So try and keep it short if possible. Um, and then think about the concept. Like think ahead of time about how the music you choose will fit with your concept and the video footage you have available. And when I'm listening to video or music that's potentially usable for video content, I'll literally be thinking about the storyline as I'm listening. And my rule of thumb is I listen to audio tracks until I find one that I think fits so well with the concept and the video and that I've already cut that I'm literally in tears. Like I'm so moved, I feel moved, I feel compelled. Like I can just visualize a story almost unfolding with the audio track. And so every time when I've done an open rescue video, uh, and obviously our open rescue videos are bigger video projects and we spend like tens of hours on this and your average social media video is not something you wanna probably spend 40 hours on. But when we are investing that much time and resources, we're going to be in the New York Times, we invest a huge amount of money and labor and, and human power into these videos, I will keep going through audio until I find an audio track that literally makes me cry. Every single audio track will make me cry. Um, this is even before I've written the storybook. And by that point, if the audio track is making me cry, I lay it out in Final Cut Pro like this, right? We've got the audio track right here. And, and then I'll start thinking about, and what I'll do is I'll listen to the audio, and find where the natural points for new captions to cross. So like, let's listen to this video, or this audio track. So there's one. So you can listen to like various chords, like there's, a, there's probably a beat of three or a beat of four. And each beat of three or beat of four is a natural transition point in the music. So what I'll do next is I'll lay down the audio, find how many natural transition points, how many bars are on the video, and then I'll open up a Google Doc, like this, uh-oh. Okay, here's an example storyboard. Uh oh, what's going on? There we go. That is not the right link. Uh, let me find a storyboard. 
Daylight Open Rescue Storyboard. There we go. Okay. Just link to this. Oops. Okay. Okay. And I'll find um, an audio track. Um, and then for each, each basic bar in the music, I'll list out a number. So in this particular track, we can listen to this track together. Um, and I, we're going to start the track at five seconds. There, there are about 29 bars, right? And I know there's about 29 places where I could use captions. And, and captions pretty much are necessary. Pretty much every big video platform is now using captions. Again, because 70 80% of your audience is not going to be watching audio. So if you don't have captions, it's useless. Um, we still occasionally do voiceovers to go along with the captions. But you know, for the most part, we're just sticking to the captions. So let's listen to this one together and even kind of um, I'm gonna. Okay. Oops. Okay, so here's the audio track. It's called Daylight Open Rescue Audio. I think this is actually taken from, like, I think a turret or Priya found this audio track. Um, so, big shout out to them for making this. And a video that's gonna be coming out is using this audio track. I think it was actually a turret who found this audio track. And, um, I listened to this audio track and thought like at around five seconds is the right time to start this. And actually let's listen to four or five seconds and just get the entire track. Let's start over. Okay. One. Two. Three, four, right? Okay, so in each of those, each of those beats, each of those bars is a natural transition point, point. and that doesn't mean the story has to unfold according to those bars. But if you don't have your story unfold in a way that's consistent with the music, it'll be jarring to the person who's listening to it. It'll just seem out of sorts. Well, if it's all coordinated together, it amplifies the emotional effect because you can feel all the transitions in the music. The music, the video, and the captions all work together in telling a compelling story. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll look at the key video clips, I'll think about the concept, and I'll listen to audio quite a few times. You know, and usually they're short clips, so like if it's a two-minute clip, I might listen to it like 30 times and just think about, okay, what is like the natural storyline that we could tell together um, with, with these different pieces with the music that we have? And then I'll start writing the storyboard. Um, and actually, why don't we just read this storyboard? I think you did this at the video production meeting, too. We'll read the storyboard and give you a sense of how this audio clip would unfold um, with the storyboard that we read. And I'll, you know, the storyboard, usually what I'll do, just, writing is always the same. Like, most people spend way too much time thinking about writing instead of just writing. <laughs> and one of the, the great writers, I think it was Dostoevsky, once said that there are no great writers, there are only great editors, right? And so the, the important thing is just get something on paper. Find out how many bars you have and how much space you have available, which will give you a rough sense of what sort of story you can tell, and then start writing. And when you're writing captions for video, it's got to be short. It's got to be super concise, simple language. Don't use fancy $5 words. I'm a huge fan. I'm a sesquipedalianist. Does anyone know what a sesquipedalianist is? Anyone heard this word? I think you know this word. Someone who loves big words. Exactly. So I am a sesquipedalianist. Like, I used to be obsessed with big words because... I studied for the SAT too hard when I was like 17 or 16 years old. Um, so I like using $5 words in my personal kind of personal life. And if you've talked to me much, like you've probably heard me use all these stupid $5 words and no one understands. That's not what you do in videos. Like don't be like me in videos. Like use super simple language. Um, but just start writing and just like see how it unfolds. Listen to the music again. Think about the video footage you have and just keep writing and writing and writing until you have a storyboard. Where again, like my goal is basically get to the point where even before I have any video set out, like I can almost see the video unfolding and the music and the words together are making me cry. Like they're making me so moved and fired up and inspired. Like I want to get up and fight. I want to get up and protest. I want to run to a slaughterhouse and rescue animals. I'm weeping and, and, and just terror at what the animals are having to endure. And like that's your goal, right? To have a storyboard that's that powerful. And I'll tell you a little bit about like what makes for an effective storyboard, but let's read this together first. Because I actually, this is a video that a terror is working on actually. Um, and I really like the storyboard and music, and Terry and I are kind of working on it together. You dream of a world where every slaughterhouse is gone, where the huddling masses are rescued, not killed, 
where the animals live free and where innocents no longer have to die. At GXC, we don't wait for the dream. We bring the dream to life. In May, we walked into this slaughterhouse and we started taking the animals out. The slaughterhouse tried to stop us. The police demanded that we leave. But with hundreds carrying white flowers, we were unstoppable. We bore witness to their suffering. We cried for the ones we left behind. We promised we'd do everything to give them hope for a better world. And one by one, the little birds came back to life. We named each one hope in a different town. And here we're going to show each of the six birds, if we took them, to them in a different language. Two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Together, they gave us hope for change. They inspired us to speak. They inspired us to fight. We promised them we'd have twice as many next year. In May 2018, a dream of a world without slaughterhouses will start coming to life. So even just reading that, I've read this a thousand times, but even that reading that again and having read it a thousand times, that, did it? Did anyone feel anything? Like, and again, there's no visuals there yet. Like, so imagine how powerful this is going to be with visuals. And you want to get to that point. So I really encourage people, the storyboard is really, really important. Um, and this is why script writers get paid a billion dollars and why, like, you know, honestly, there's some movies that it doesn't matter how good the, the cinematographer and the director is, like the script is bad, it's gonna be a terrible movie. And the same is true of a one minute and a half social media video. Like, have a good storyboard first and spend a lot of time on that, because that's like the skeleton. It's kind of like a human being who's got a faulty skeleton. Like, it doesn't matter how great your muscles are, your ligaments, your heart, your organs, if your skeleton is broken, like you're not gonna be a very effective human being. And the same is true of a video. Like, have a good storyboard. Um, so a couple things about stories that I think are really important is one, and at least for social media purposes, but increasingly even for long form content. And honestly, I'm the greatest and the worst example of this. Like you gotta start out with something strong. Um, increasingly in the Twitter and Facebook and Instagram universe, like if someone doesn't see something that has like one of the steps in like the first two seconds, they're done. Like you've gotta attract their attention instantly because people have such a short attention span and frankly, even big bit budget movies like nowadays. Like, you know, it used to be people watch thoughtful movies like Casablanca and like, you know, Gone with the Wind and or is like nodding her head and like she I can tell you look a little distressed by this or but modern day people don't watch movies anymore. They they want like action movies. They want like Captain America and the Hulk and Spider Man. Like the first thing that happens is like there's a bad guy beating somebody up, but like there's some important question. So like at every point in your video you should be presenting something that's engaging enough that has one of the steps. And, and one part of any good story is unanswered questions. You're like, you, you should always be thinking about why is this person continuing to watch this video? Like you should be raising questions, creating anxiety, creating a sense of awe or an anticipation, right? Like, so starting a video saying like, a thousand people walked into this slaughterhouse and shut it down. Like people are gonna wanna see like, oh my God, I wanna see this. Like, so showing them, telling them this is what you're gonna see. Like if you keep watching, Here's what I'm gonna give you, right? And so at every point in your video, when I'm editing a video, I'm always thinking about what is it that I have already indicated this person they're going to see next that's gonna keep them watching. Maybe it's an unanswered question that creates anxiety. Maybe it's a sense of hilarity. They know the punchline is coming. There's like a joke that's developing and they wanna see like the punchline. Like, you know, you've probably seen these candid camera things where someone is like pretending to be like, I saw this thing recently um, where Aaron Judge, does anyone know who Aaron Judge is? He's like a big shot New York Yankees um, baseball player. He's got like 35 home runs, but he's a rookie, so not a lot of people know him. And there's this video that went viral recently where Aaron Judge pretends to be a journalist and interviews people about Aaron Judge, and he's wearing glasses. And so like, you see Aaron Judge like talking to these people about Aaron Judge. It's like, what do you think about Aaron Judge? And like, you know, like, oh my God, like there's gonna be a moment coming where like he tells them I'm Aaron Judge, takes his glasses off, and it's gonna be hilarious, right? 
So and you keep watching because you're like, oh my god, I got, I can't, I, I want to see what's going to happen when he like, takes his glasses off. And so you should always be thinking about what in this video is going to keep this person drawn in because there's a thousand other things. There's like bells and whistles on YouTube and Facebook that are drawing them in. I want them stuck in my video at least for two minutes. So let's give them something that's interesting. Um, other aspects of stories that are really important: conflict, right? If there isn't some sort of challenge, like the classic Star Wars, Luke Skywalker is like a poor little kid and he develops these incredible powers and defeats the evildoers. Because, but for a long time, there's a lot of adversity and he has to overcome it. And we're not worried. And we're really worried that he's not going to make it because he's just poor little Luke Skywalker. He doesn't know how to use a lightsaber, right? So, like. Seeing people overcome challenges and face challenges initially that seem really difficult and overcome them, right? So whether it's the activists themselves or animals who are just enduring horrible trauma, but you see them build up and get stronger and stronger, and eventually you see them walk outside, and that moment is just awe-inspiring people. They want to see it. And if you flag ahead of time, like, you know, the Lily video, I think the caption was, this rescued piglet never gave up, you know? And like, you know, oh my God, this piglet didn't give up. So I know even if I'm seeing, like, the piglet suffering and the piglet you know, languishing in a crate, there's going to be a moment that really makes me want to keep watching because I want to see this piglet walk into the sun for the first time. And you want to flag that. Let people know that's coming because otherwise they're going to drop out. If you just have all this gory footage and say, like, piglets are being eaten a lot, it's like, God, why do I want to watch that? I want to see the punchline. I want to see what's going to draw me in. Um, so I can talk on and on about what makes for effective storytelling, but that would be a totally different presentation, so I'm just going to move on. On the checklist, so you got the storyboard. Um, now we're going to start talking about editing the video. Um, so just like the beginning of the story should be strong, um, the first, literally the first scene that people see is the most important one, right? And like, we go back to these, these kind of um, important types of video content, right? Like these are really crucial types of video content that we know really motivate people. So think about what types of video you have that is video that you've seen go viral before in the past, that has really just blown up on, on Facebook. And you should really think about starting your video clip with a scene like that. So I'm just going to go through the Lily video. Let's watch the video, Lily video together. But the first thing to note is, lo and behold, we've got a video clip of a human being cuddling with a piglet, a super cute piglet. right? And this is one of the classic types of video that draws people in. And it's the first scene people see. It's like, oh my gosh, cute piglet. Oh my gosh, the piglet gives a guy a kiss. Oh my gosh, the guy gives a piglet a kiss. It's like. You're already sold. You're like, I want to watch this video. What's going to happen to this piglet? That piglet's so cute. And then you see like kind of a sad clip, right? Of like, oh my gosh, he's in a crate. And your immediate thought process is, hopefully, you know, most people are thinking to themselves, where did she come from? Why is she there? Like, how does she get to this person's house where she's happy now, right? And you want to you want to find out what her story is because she's obviously happy now, and you're already enamored and personally connected to her because you see this beautiful clip of somebody kissing a piglet. And now we're opening things up. Okay, but let's just watch this real quick. So just a couple things about the video clips that were chosen here. Um, you know, you always want video footage that shows faces, ideally. And again, you're, you're expressing emotion, right? So. When we, we, when we selected this particular video clip, you see Mama here like staring through the cages and she looks really sad, like she's, she's worried about something. And then you pan over to her girls and you see, oh, this is why she's sad, she's got her babies right next to her and she's stuck behind these bars, right? Um, and the next clip again is Mama just staring right at us. And that emotional connection is an animal staring right into your eyes. Like human beings are very visual animals and, and we really read faces, like even looking at Cat right now. Like, I'm, I'm communicating with her. Even though she's not talking to me, I'm not talking to her, we're communicating. We've got like this mind melt going on. It's like crazy Vulcan stuff is happening. None of you even understand it. It's like this deep, primitive, emotional stuff that's happening because I'm looking at her face and she's looking at mine. But the same happens with non-human animals too. Okay, so let's just keep going. But bars stopping her from caring for her babies, this is triggering anxiety in people, right? Like it's like, Anytime a mama is stopped from helping her own kids, that creates anxiety in us. It creates sadness too, but it's like, oh my gosh, I gotta do something about this. Like there's bars, let's get the bars out of the way. Or like help mama get to her kids. Cause like anytime a mom is separated from her kids, I mean every mom, like I'm sure Aura's had this experience. Like when, you're, when, you're, when your child is lost, that creates a lot of anxiety, right? And, and, and all of us have had the experience too of probably being lost yourselves. Like getting separated from your mom and you're freaking out. It's like, where's mama, where's mama, you know? Keep watching. And again, the face, the tongue hanging out, 
this is very strong gripping emotional footage, right? You're like, you, you, and you've probably never seen something like this too, where a mother pig is laying on concrete and her tongue is hanging out, she's so defeated. So, and one thing is, you know, the, the captions here really do enhance the narrative considerably because most people just don't understand what's happening. And like even thinking about how hard this concrete is, when we were there in person and Paul and I were there, like we saw how brutal that was. That they have to, I mean, imagine sleeping on concrete with soft skin every single day of your life, not even be able to turn around. Like this is why they develop with these sores all over their body. They get these nasty cuts and infections all their skin because they're constantly just laying on this abrasive hard surface. And just imagining an entire life where you don't, you don't even have the concept of softness. Like you don't, like it just doesn't even occur to you that there's anything soft in the world. Like comfort doesn't even register in your brain because your entire life has been harshness and hardness. And so many of these animals endure this. And like if you're just watching it for a second, you don't understand that. So we need to convey that to them. So add details that you don't need to, if, so the captions should always add something beyond what the visuals are adding. And the visuals are already telling you something, you don't need to have the caption. And this visual, if we, if we send this caption, Mama was lying on the ground. That would be a dumb caption. Like, there's no need to have that caption. The person watching this video already knows Mama's lying on the ground. But the person might not realize because they weren't there. Feeling the hardness that we feel, and feeling the hardness that Mama feels every single day of his life, is that the ground is hard and it, it prevents them from sleeping, right? That's something, and all of us have had an experience of sleeping in an uncomfortable way. All of us can relate and empathize with his Mama Pig. But we wouldn't have understood that without the caption. So if the caption doesn't actually add something, Forget it, because you don't need the distraction, just use the visuals. And that's debatable whether you need that. I think it's probably useful to have those captions, because people, you know, if they just see the fuzziness, they're not even thinking about the fact the animals have to breathe it, because it's, you know, the animals aren't present in this particular video clip. So I think it's useful, but let's keep going. Again, anxiety inducing, right? This is like, you got a baby who's hurt, her foot's caught. If you have a baby whose foot is caught somewhere, that creates anxiety, because you feel like, oh, I need to help her. Like, what are we gonna do? Like, there's a baby who's hurt. And again, mama expressing like distress, trying to break out. I remember one of those key video clips that we talked about that always go viral is animals trying to break out of cages. And then again, like the face, the emotional expression, you could see that, you know, the baby piglet looks defeated, right? And when there's a transition in the music, that's a natural place for the transition in the storyline too, right? So like, we got like, it's kind of all kind of down, a little bit sad. And the music becomes a little more uplifting, and that's like, oh, there's a transition, there's this big problem, which is, Mama's stuck behind these bars, baby's hurt, and that's creating a lot of anxiety in us. And there's a solution now, right? There's something that, that people have been waiting for this moment for a while because you already flagged this baby safe, and here's the moment. Like, and the music, the music connects with that, the video connects with that, and the captions also connect with that. And actually, just one thing to note, um, our open rescue teams have, been, have consistently, historically, not gotten enough video footage of the activists themselves, so, you know, Paul and I just have to remind ourselves in the future, we always want to get more video footage of activists. And again, all these transitions are happening on the beat, right? It's every bar, there's like a beat of four, and then a, and the transition, beat of four and transitions. And you don't have to be that religious about this, but I think especially if you're an early stage video editor and you're not sure how to like cut stories in a way that like resonates with your audience and syncs up the video, the audio, and the captions, just a good rule of thumb is just, just, just stick to the bars. Just make a transition only when the, when the music's transitioning and there's like a beat of four, beat of three. Sometimes there's music that has a beat of five. You should be able to figure it out just by listening to the music. There's like natural transition points because all music has a certain structure to it. Again, in here, like communication with animals against human face.
Yeah. And so consistently, people have told me over and over again that that's the favorite part of the video. This is the part that just makes you think, because it, it just makes you like, oh my God, like, baby, she's hurt. Her mama can't help her. Things are terrible. And now look at her. She gets to have a bath, and she's got, like, she looks like real, Little Red Riding Hood. She's in this little cape. She's smiling. She's got a friend. And that just makes you so happy, that transition, right? And that happened completely by video and audio. And it, there's no captions necessary at all. And I honestly feel like I use captions too much. Um, if you're a really skilled video editor and you can tell a story without the captions, then and you have the right video footage. I mean, obviously, one problem is if we're animators and we we're movie directors and we had a multi-million dollar budget, we wouldn't have to rely on the video footage that we shoot. We could just shoot more. But we aren't. So to, to a certain extent, it depends on the quality of the video footage. But in almost all of our open rescues, there are at least certain parts of the story that we could tell without captions. And I really encourage you to do that because it really allows people to connect and not have the distraction of the caption and just experience the video and audio on their own terms. Um, and you know, obviously, this is like the recovery process. But, and there are no need for captions at all. And so encourage yourself to try and find ways to cut out as much text as possible. Because the less text you have, the more people can just viscerally experience a video without the distraction of the text. Let's watch this part again. Okay, and just I'll show you just a couple things about all this video footage again. Like animals' faces are there, right? So people are emotionally connecting. They feel like they're part of the story, and they can relate to the characters in the story. Um, here you've got the activist transition. You see Lily's face, and you got John and Andrew's faces, right? Um, you see her getting put down in a crate, and you're wondering where she's going to go. She's still got the ear tag. For some reason, this is like one of my favorite parts of the video. Like seeing that ear tag get cut up, it's just a very powerful symbolic transition from being a commodity to being a person, to being a living creature who's going to, divert, who's going to be given respect for the rest of her life. Um, and then you see her getting medicine, which is you know, everything, something that every baby, especially a sick baby, deserves. Um, and you even see her kind of struggling, and that's kind of cute, because it's like, oh, poor baby doesn't want to take her medicine. Getting a bath, which again, every baby, every child, every puppy has to go through at some point. And then, yeah, obviously this is like the classic thing to do. Like, you know, a dog will shake her, shake her head and shake her body and splash water everywhere. And, you know, creating that emotional resonance with an experience that someone has probably had with a dog, or at least watching a dog shake their head, with a piglet, which they haven't had that experience, but now they're seeing it for the first time. And then finally, like, just cuddling her and holding her in a blanket. And the same way you'd swaddle a baby, right? Like, we, we literally swaddled Lily the way we'd swaddle, the way I swaddled my nieces after they had gas. And we held her the same way. We kissed her. And she even looked up. I mean, she looks very human-like here, doesn't she? She looks like a human baby. So this, I knew when I saw this video footage, this was like, I mean, I, I was tempted to use this video footage at the beginning, but I thought it was so powerful to use in the transition point here that, like, this was, like, really, really key video footage. See, I mean, she just looks so cute there. And that's, like, unbelievably cute, and it's so human-like. Right? And again, what we're trying to do is relate the animal's experience to human beings. And human beings, unfortunately, you know, I mean, with respect, let me just make sure the live stream is still working. Okay, live stream is still working. Human beings, unfortunately, when it comes to other cultures, other races, and certainly other species, there, there's a natural barrier. I mean, even seeing someone just looks a little different from us. There's a massive amount of cognitive psychology that just, you know, having a white person see an Asian person or an Asian person see a black person, there's this immediate wall that gets put up, and you don't necessarily understand them, you feel alien and different from them. And we want to tear down that wall so people feel like we're all the same. We all experience the same things, have the same struggles, have the same joy, feel the same love. And, and so having, having video footage and storytelling that relates the experience this animal is going through to an experience someone personally has probably had is very, very powerful. And even in our open rescue missions, we try to actually do that too. Like when we're enacting things, we try to give the animals the same care we give to a puppy or a human child, which is why we swallowed her, because we're, we're worried she's cold. We didn't just give her a bath and throw her in the barn. We swallowed her, we, we laid next to her. I slept with her for like a couple nights, and she like slept on my chest and pooped on me even. Like, you know, probably a lot of parents have had the experience with a child pooping on them, or he pooped on me, you know, and so like documenting all those experiences and relating them to experiences that human beings have had with each other is really important. Okay. And then Lily comes back to life, and we got, again, adorable face first video footage of her engaging in interaction. It's like she's she's literally like coming back to life, right? And then you just find other cute video footage. And then um, and I think you know the captions are often necessary just so people because sometimes people will watch footage and of an animal they're not used to seeing and they won't even code that as playing. They'll code it as like 
something else, like they're fighting or they're just being weird. You know, it's kind of like, again, going to a foreign culture. Even if they're doing a lot of the same things we do, so in Asian cultures, you know, we sit and have dinner and just, and just have sit Indian style and sit like on the ground, you know, without chairs. And for a lot of people are seeing that, instead of seeing like a very familiar environment where people will be connecting with each other and enjoying food together, they just see the weirdness of the fact you're sitting down on the ground, right? And so we need to explain to them, no, this is like the same table fellowship that you have in the United States, just because we sit on the ground doesn't mean it's not the same. And similarly, a lot of times people, when they see animals interacting with each other, like they'll see Lily Little snipping at her, at her sister and think, oh, you know, oh, those animals are being brutally violent. So the caption helps just code things and interpret things for people so they don't immediately have their prejudices influence the emotional context of the video footage. But arguably, you don't need this caption. I mean, among animal rights activists, I don't think you do, but to the extent for showing this to an average omnivore who's never had an experience with a pig, they might see this immediately see pig and think like brutish, you know, nasty, dirty animals and not understand what is actually happening here, which is two babies playing with each other, you know, which happens among all species of mammals pretty much across the entire world, including human beings. And, and, and even evoking like that she learned to play because people don't necessarily realize that when they're living in a gestation crate or a farrowing crate or a nursery and certainly in a finishing barn, they never have a moment of positive interaction with anyone. They have to learn to play and it, it takes a while for them to recover from this. It takes a few days before they feel safe enough and comfortable enough and they just like understand that they have the freedom now to do the things that all animals want to do including play with each other. Because there's no baby animal that doesn't play. There's no baby mammal. Oh wow, look, you're outside for the first time. And again, ending with a scene that's like, again, one of these classic scenes. Because if there's, if there's a scene that's as important as the first segment of the video, it's probably the last segment, because this is the last segment, is a segment that's going to like induce in people the emotions that, that you want to get them to share it, to get them to engage it, engage with the content in a meaningful way, comment on it, um, show their friends and their family. So that last scene of every movie is really important. Um, I'll just talk about a couple of the things. Um, the type of caption you use is pretty important. Like if you use like, a crappy font that looks kind of awkward and, you know, comic stands, um, it's going to detract from the video considerably. Um, we have, like, a staple of reliable fonts that we use, like Helvetica Neue Bold. Um, this font that I'm using in this video is Coolvetica, which I think is a decent font. Um, but really think about your fonts quite a bit. Um, the size of the font is important. So just look at an AJ Plus or BuzzFeed video and look at the size of their captions and make sure, because remember, a lot of people are going to be watching this on their phones. So, if you have a caption that's too small, they're going to be like, I can't see anything. They're gonna, not going to see it. I mean, the screen is already this small. So make sure your caption is big enough that someone on the mobile phone can see it. Um, the types of transitions, so like in Final Cut Pro, you have a million different types of fonts, and you can transitions and fonts, and you can kind of just test them out, right? Like, um, you know, they all fade in and out in various ways. But we have some tried and true ones that we use a lot. Like fade is one of them. So just a classic fade font, right, which just fades in and fades out. And that's just kind of a classic font. It's, it's a good transition. It's not too obtrusive. Um, again, like the caption, for the most part, is not something you want to focus too much attention on. And if, it's, if you get too fancy, like, you know, if you're doing something like clouds, I mean, you probably don't want to do this, right? This is, this is like, you do this when your video footage is crap, because this is going to distract people, and you, you know, there's no real reason to do this, unless there's some specific need for that particular transition. Um, and then transitions. So, like, I, I think hard about what types of transitions. So transitions in Final Cut Pro are how clips um, switch between each other. So there's all different types of trans transitions, right? There's cross dissolve, which is like one scene dissolving to the other. 3D rectangle. You basically never want to use one of the fancier fonts. I mean, you can if you're being if it's some tacky video that's a little funnier. But um, I usually just use uh, honestly. I usually use fade to color, which is like black, and then reappear to another one. This is like, and if you watch movie trailers, I really encourage people to watch movie trailers. Because movie trailers, these are, you know, $300 million movies, and they're trying to distill their movie into like a 30-second to two-minute clip that will get people excited. And that's exactly what we're trying to do. So watch movie trailers. And if you watch movie trailers, basically they use two types of transitions. One is just the abrupt transition, which is no transition at all, which happens when you want like a little bit of abruptness. So like if there's a fight scene and it goes from like me punching cat, and then there's like a cut in the video and cat is punching me, like you don't need like a soft fade between those two scenes. Like you can just abruptly transition from me punching cat to cat punching me um, and me getting knocked out because cat's really strong and she's a very violent person. I'm even a little terrified right now looking at her that she's, no, I'm just kidding, cat. Cat's not violent at all, just kidding. For all you in the live stream, yeah. cats, 
Cat's very nonviolent. I shouldn't even joke about that because Cat's a very gentle soul. Um, but if Cat were to punch me and I were to punch her, the transition would probably be like a, a clean cut. And so thinking a lot about transitions and about like how abrupt you want your transitions. So I, I specifically think about every transition. Think about how harsh should this transition be? So that's a soft transition right there. And the reason it's soft is because I know there's like a fade in the music and there's like a, a kind of a fade in the storyline too where, you know, we have like the intro to the trailer where I'm talking about this is a story of a piglet who was saved and the man who found her in a cage. And then we actually start the real story. So in that transition, I think you can have a soft kind of fade to black. And there's a lot of ways to do fades. This particular fade I did here was not actually a fade that was through a transition. In Final Cut Pro, oops. In Final Cut Pro, you can do this thing called show your video animation, um, show the opacity, um, and create like key points on the video. So like anytime you click option, you can add more touch points to this video, right? And you can make the video kind of change in opacity considerably. So like if I do this, for example, let's watch it now. It's gonna get opaque, right? And then opaque again, right? And so I, I did a manual um, shift to the opacity of this video because, and the reason I did that instead of using the fade transition was because I wanted like a slow fade and then abrupt. Like I didn't want it to fade out and then fade in. I wanted it to fade out and then bam, because I wanted the start of the story. And like this is an aesthetic thing. You could just try different fades. And, but generally like the two main things you want to use are fade to color, which is under dissolves. And this is like, again, probably the most classic fade that you'll see in any movie trailer or any movie. And then just a uh, abrupt one. And then cross dissolve is sometimes interesting too. And you'll see this in movies periodically too, where you kind of go from one scene to the other and the one scene is like fading out and the other scene is fading in. This transition is, tends to be very useful when you're doing some sort of parallel. So like I use it a lot when we're showing like an animal in a cage and then the animal saves. Like, and I'll even try and find video footage where it's, it's almost like you can lay the video footage on top of itself. So like the animal's in the same position, like maybe she's looking to the right and she's about three-fourths of the screen, and then I'll try and find like sanctuary footage that looks very similar. And then using the cross dissolve is very powerful because you can literally like see the transition from the animal suffering to the animal saved. Um, so other things, like audio levels are really important. Um, so you are gonna have to change the audio levels on every one of your clips. So just change the audio levels, and what I'll usually try and do is create enough background noise to serve two functions. One is, um, if you have a little bit of background noise, you can avoid a copyright violation because you're not just like straight up copying the music of some famous song, but you've got some distractions. And so like, you know, no one can argue that you're gonna try and monetize a stream of like the next Katy Perry song because no one's gonna play the Katy Perry song from your video if there's like piglets squealing in the background too. I mean, the only people who are gonna watch that are people who watch your video. And that's important from a legal perspective to maintain fair use, that you've transformed the content enough that it's not the same as the original. Um, but the most important thing and the main reason to keep the audio is just like it adds some backdrop to it. So like in many of these scenes, like, you know, I mean, probably this is the most obvious one. Like, you know, there are a lot of scenes. Oh, wow, look, you're outside for the first time. Like you want that audio to be loud enough that people can actually hear. I mean, if I could reshoot that, I don't like the voice I'm using in that particular clip because it sounds kind of tacky. But, you know, you basically, you want the audio to be loud enough that people can hear what you want them to hear and no loud and suppress it and just shut it down. And usually, um, for open rescue videos at least, I almost have to, always have to reduce the audio considerably. So in most of these clips, especially from the farms, because farms are loud places, you see I'm like reducing it by 33 decibels, reducing it by 23, and I'll go through the entire video and just all, adjust all the audios. In audio as a video, you can create transitions in audio. Um, so for example, I'll show you. Um, the classic way to transition between two audio clips um, is to, I'll show you guys real quick here. Okay, so what I did there, say, say these were two separate clips that I'm trying to merge into each other and transition. So the classic way to do this is to fade, um, to extend them out so they're kind of like stuck to each other like this. And then you just take these little fade bars and go like this, right? And if you listen to this, it's probably gonna roughly say, sound the same as the integrated clip. Right? That seems completely seamless. It sounded like it sounded like I didn't even cut it, but this is actually, I have now two separate clips that I just faded one out, faded one in the same way, and so they merge together very well. And this is useful oftentimes when you're trying to connect up different clips. Um, lots of times we have to do some editing of audio clips to make sure it actually works with the video we're trying to create, and, and using that technique is pretty important. Because lots of times you'll create new transitions between audio clips, and 
you know, like maybe like you have an audio clip that's six minutes and you want to cut it down to one in a minute and a half. And so you have to, but the, the pieces don't really work together in a way that makes it intelligible at one minute and a half because you actually want like the first 30 seconds and the last 30 seconds. Uh, and the way you're going to connect those together is by doing exactly what I just did there. Like cut those two clips in half or cut those clips, um, extend them out, drag them out, each out. And then, and a lot of this is just like playing it by ear. You might have to drag it around a little and get the fades perfectly, but this is the way you do it. And this is something I learned from an audio person. Okay, um, what else about the video? Yeah, I, again, just you know, thinking about how the audio and the captions and the storytelling work perfectly, right? Because you know, when when the music is triumphant, you know, the video should be triumphant. The caption should be triumphant. When the music is is kind of going through a um, a sad point, like if it's it's kind of getting scary and dark from a happy point, then you should be creating anxiety in people and taking them from a place where they feel the animal's safe to suddenly they're dangerous. You know, and movies do the same thing. Like we've all seen like the classic psycho scene where, you know, the woman's in the shower, it's quiet, and then suddenly the music starts going dun dun dun, you know, like there's scary music. And you want to think about all those all those pieces to your video in the same way. Okay. Um, let me see what's on the checklist about editing. Okay. So what I'll generally do is I'll lay the audio down, right? And I've got, and I'll usually even lay down the audio with a bunch of captions that are just like dummy captions. Like oftentimes I'll even have the text in them. And the audio gets laid down first. It gets laid down under the timeline like this. And I'll just have like some dummy timeline. Maybe if it's just captions on the timeline. And then I'll, I'll write out the captions. I'll even probably watch it. You know, lots of times I'll watch the video that's completely black, right? So I'll watch it like this kind of, right? I just have captions. And just make sure like I can see it makes sense after I lay down the captions. Um, and then, and only then, I'll start placing clips. Um, play strong clips at the start, again. Um, always just focus on your strongest clips throughout the entire video. Um, and then you place other clips on the timeline that roughly fit the storyboard. And then you can revise the storyboard based on the video footage you have. So every storyboard I've ever used is not the final storyboard. Like the storyboard I start with is usually, you know, probably about 30% of it at least will change. And the same is true from what I understand in movie production, even when they have, you know, complete control over the video clips they shoot. So like James Cameron, he doesn't have to worry about what video clips he has because he can just go shoot more. He's a billionaire and he's got like these big, huge motion picture studios who will supply him as many cameras and as many, as much footage as he wants. But even for them, they usually do adjust the storyboard and the script considerably based on how the story feels like it's unfolding with the video. So go back and adjust the story. Get feedback on your video. Um, don't wait until the very end to get feedback. Get feedback earlier because lots of times you think your video is awesome and you think the video makes a lot of sense. But I usually will show my videos to at least like 20 or 30 people, you know, and, and I'll pick a, a pretty wide audience of people. So animal rights activists, vegans who are not animal rights activists, like random family members of mine who aren't even vegan, um, old friends of mine who are not vegan, and just get a sampling of perspectives on how they feel about the video, what parts. And what I'm usually looking for most of all is because lots of times people don't have like a rational sense of why they like or don't like a video, but they know there are certain parts of a movie. And even like if you think about movies that you like, like there's certain like movie critics who can, you know, can, can make abstract and develop some sort of theory as to why they like or don't like certain parts of the movie. What you mostly remember is just like, I love that scene. Or I hate that scene. That scene was like cringeworthy. And maybe you want to turn the TV off. Are there some scenes that like, maybe you don't even understand why. I just love that scene. And usually it's, the reason it's hard to tell is because usually it's a, a, it's a complicated, combination of emotions, visual stimuli, audio stimuli, the history of the movie that are combining to create an emotional effect. So what I'll usually do is ask like 20 to 30 people, what are the parts of the video that you like the most? What are the parts of the video you don't like? And in particular, that make you want to stop watching. Um, revise the video based on feedback. And then finally, do post-processing. Don't do any post-processing until you're done. Like, because post-processing, post-processing is basically like doing all the audio transitions, uh, changing audio levels, like only change audio levels to the extent that you need to to actually hear. So like if some of the video clips are too loud for you to even hear the music and reduces your ability to edit properly, then adjust the audio levels. But otherwise, do all the fine refining at the end because if you do all that fine refining and you realize, oh my god, I'm not even going to use any of these clips, you just wasted a bunch of time. So do all your post-processing, um, the, the refining of the captions, the placement of the captions, the transitions between video clips at the very end. Okay, so let's watch one other video, which is the um, the Scarlet video, and this got about 500,000 views. Um, let's just watch it together and just 
talk things through. And then maybe I'll take some questions on this video, and then we'll go through the final few pieces. So this is already creating anxiety, right? It's like, was born in this dark windowless shed. Um, and while I usually don't like to start with something this grim, um, and if we do start with something this grim, I always make sure the caption indicates this animal's gonna make it out, right? Because if you start with something too grim and people just know this animal's gonna live in terror and then die, like, that's not gonna make them wanna keep watching. In fact, the graphic footage tends to make people drop out. And the graphic footage also sometimes makes people angry, and so there is value in having video footage that's very graphic. But the video footage that tends to go hyper viral, that gets like hundreds of thousands of views, tends to be positive, right? There's some happy ending. So this is grim, but it's also like not so disgusting that it's unbearable, and you can kind of actually even see your face. Um, and also what I'm doing here is what's called a Ken Burns effect, right? So we're focusing on Scarlett's face, because I'm trying to get you to make an emotional connection. Um, you can Google what a Ken Burns effect is, but it's basically you know, you're, you're, you're zooming in into one particular segment of the video. And you have like the dark fade, right? There's a slow fade. And because the music is kind of a strong transition, like I did the same thing where I have a soft transition with the music fading, and the music hits hard, so I want the transition to hit hard too. Right, so this video footage is so bam. It's not, it's not a soft fade back in, it's just like bam, it hits you really hard. And this just makes people angry, right? Just like seeing that, it's just, it's shocking and just anger inducing. So it's like, oh my God, like that's unbelievable. Like those chickens, I can't believe they live like that. And it's even more anger inducing that, you know, safe way of saying this is cage free and humane, right? Which is again, 35,000 birds in one shed and focusing on those faces. It's almost like you can see each of these individuals and it's, it's hard to even fathom that much consciousness. Every time, like, Paul and I go into one of these farms, like, afterwards, we, we, I often talk about, like, just unbelievable how much life there was in there. And just imagining, like, every single one of those beings had a separate consciousness. And I could have gotten to know every single one of them. 35,000 in one barn, you know? And that's, like, there's three barns just in that location, and there's, like, 30 barns on the entire site. And every single one of them has that much life in it, that much consciousness. And every single one of those birds is unique. Every single one has different tastes, different pleasures, different fears, you know, different size, different ailments they're enduring. It's just unbelievable to, just impossible to understand how much consciousness there is. And this, this video segment sort of just hands and shows that. Again, she's expressing some emotion, fear. You see her like exhibiting experiences. Like all of us have probably like been in a crowd and maybe even a little scared and had to move away. And that's exactly what she does. <laughs> yeah, this is such a sad segment, right? Where she's, you see that she's like weak, she's featherless, she's very sick. And when she finally gets to the trough, there's nothing there. And she's pecking and she can't get any food. And when we saw that too, all of us were heartbroken. Like, oh my God, this poor bird. Actually, let's just watch this one. So
the truth. Animals feel fear. Just like us. Animals feel love. Just like us. So let's go through this one more time. Actually, does anyone have any comments on that? Now that we've discussed things quite a bit, is that any the questions? Same word at the end? Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. But the visual trans transformation you start with, like yeah. and how the music really just like hits you, you know, that that crescendo. Yeah. That. We're missing like the interesting thing. There's a photo of like in between that scarlet in the middle. Of yeah. There. Probably like She's a couple like, weeks in. Getting her photos back. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's actually one downside to that video that I think a lot of people just didn't even realize it's the same bird. Because it's such a big transition, you know? Yeah, you can, you can see it today. You can still recognize her eyes still Yeah, because of all the pecking. All right, so any other comments? Otherwise, well, let's just watch this again, and I'll try and break down what I was trying to do a little bit more. So we're going to move very slowly through here. And we're going to have to make way for ourselves. So this is all just like setting out the town. Again, the classic, the archetype story of almost every kind of movie is, you know, there's a protagonist, you make a connection with the protagonist, like maybe there's some development of the protagonist, so you feel connected to them, and then they face some difficult challenge that like is, is scary, it's difficult, it's a disease, it's a threat, and then they have to like overcome that challenge, right? They have to like work really hard. Um, and, and maybe it gets desperate and they get to the brink, and then something happens, and there's a transition, like a climax that allows them to possibly overcome that challenge, and you get to watch them recover, and then there's a happy ending at the end. So like, this is like a classic story archetype. So she's suffering. Burns here to begin to focus on her bad eyes. And you've got the transition. And the music comes in and it's going to story the transition right here. And the beauty of the life is something changing. And yeah, in all the scenes, just always try to avoid cliches where, where possible. So, you know. And, and don't don't say things like, oh, you know, there's dead birds on the ground. Like, again, the caption's not necessary. So saying we're sifting through birds searching for life, it's, it's you know, it's, you don't usually see people going through the garbage dump at a factory farm trying to find a live animal. There's very little footage of that. And this video alone doesn't represent that. So the caption is evoking something that's unique. Like everything, every caption, every video is saying, like, something new is interesting. If, if, it's, if everything is the same as every other video you've ever seen about animal rights, it's not going to be interesting. It's not going to make people want to share it. Novelty is really important. So always try and like shoot video, create storylines that have novel elements in them. So, I mean, you can see, like, the Lily and the Scarlet videos are almost like the same video, almost, right? Right? In many ways. I mean, there are different elements to them, but the structure is very similar. And it's a very tried and true structure where every time we make a video like this, we get at least hundreds of thousands of views. I just love that video because you can tell she's kind of trying to make her way and figure out how does the world work? Like, do I peck at this? And she pecks at the leaf and she's a little scared off, right? So find video footage like that that expresses some, something more than just like, animal eating food is not interesting. Animal searching for food and then getting scared by it and like trying to figure out what's going on with that, that's like way more interesting. Pig and chicken are best friends, and you know, everybody loves those sort of things. And then the video transitions, the music transitions, and we go back to like the beginning because it's getting a little dark again. So Scarlet will never forget. And the music cross dissolve right there, right? So this is a place where 
using a cross dissolve, I think, works. So you, it's not perfect because you know the she's not sitting in exactly the right place. But ideally, would have liked to have her be in exactly the same position. But I actually looked for quite a bit of video footage to find two scenes that seem somewhat similar, so we can create this transition. Go back from the way Scarlett was, the way Scarlett is now. Or actually, the way she is now to the way she was. Because we're taking you back to where she came from. And actually, one thing that I really regret is I should have had Julian um, pull out the audio more, because if you really listen really carefully, you can hear Scarlett like screaming, and she's so cute. She's like, going, ee, ee. you know, she's like screaming the way a scared baby will scream. And these are all babies. They're baby birds. Like, even when they're grown up, I mean, they're juvenile animals, and they still chirp like baby birds. And so if I had more time, I would have had like an audio expert, like suppress all the frequencies of audio other than Scarlett's chirping, so it would have been pulled out. But I didn't have time, and it was a little bit of <laughs> And then we cross dissolve back into Scarlet today. And you see her face, like she's majestic, she's healthy. And we go to an activist taking action. And again, like the same is true of activists taking action. You want to try and find faces, emotions, connections. You want people to see the video and think, like, this could be me, or I could, this could be my friend. I understand this person. They seem like someone I could talk to, I could relate to, I could fight with. And so thinking about things like diversity is important too, right? You don't want to just show white faces. You should show people of color. You should show women. You should show people who are traditionally not elevated in the animal rights movement. So someone who's seen this is saying, wow, there are animal rights activists everywhere from all cultures and creed in all nations and all backgrounds. And one thing I didn't say is always end with a very strong call to action, like very clear and very specific. So traditional calls to action are things like um, share the story. Like that's a very, that's a common thing that AJ Plus uses. Um, other calls to action are like donate, right? Um, sign up to the mailing list, take action at a protest near you. But the more specific the action is, we used to always just say take action near you, and we found that wasn't really specific enough. And like most people would say, like, oh, I can't take action. I'm in Alaska, or Alaska, or in Russia, and I don't even know any other vegans. So trying to create a call to action that people actually feel like they can do to help Scarlet, and one simple thing everyone can do is share the story. So I think a lot of people watch to the end of the story if they're moved by Scarlett's story and they want to help her. One simple thing you can do is just share the story. Click the share button. And we have a hashtag and a URL. Okay. Um, I'll just briefly talk about the release. Um, come up with a catchy social media caption. The thumbnail and the caption are the most important marketing points for your video. So spend a lot of time. Like, it doesn't matter how good your video is. If people aren't interested enough in the caption and the thumbnail, to actually watch it and forget about it. And just go look at a popular YouTube channel, like, you know, who's that guy who, like, is the most popular YouTuber in the world? You know what I'm talking about. He, like, plays video games. PewDie PewDiePie, PewDiePie. So go to PewDiePie's channel or go to, like, BuzzFeed or AJ Plus or Upworthy. See what sort of thumbnails they use and what captions they use. They tend to be really short. Again, they're interesting. They, they trigger one of the steps initially just from reading the caption and looking at the thumbnail. Um, I say that uh, YouTubers will say, like, if it happens in real life, like, I got a joke instead of a Pepsi, they title the video, like, my server tried to poison me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The most yeah, the most exciting angle that, like, makes people want to know more. Yeah. That's, sometimes that's kind of deceptive. Gets, yeah. Yeah. Gets yeah. No, that's true. Yeah. The Young Turks does this all the time, and it always irritates me. Because they always have, like, uh, a clip that makes it seem like, like, you know, it's, you know, LeBron James and Kyrie Irving get into a fist fight, and there's like a thumbnail that looks like they're fighting, and then I watch the entire video, and there's no fist fight. I'm like, what the hell? Like, it's just two people talking to each other. But, you know, I mean, they've been very successful. So I don't know. Um, ask pages that might like to share the content to share it. And, you know, don't, we tend not to overdo this. You know, we can't take advantage of our relationship with PETA every single time. We think the content's strong enough, and it relates to their content, especially if we think that it actually adds value to their page to share it. That's the best way for us to get our content out, because um, we don't have an advertising budget. Um, we might actually start some, sending some money on Facebook advertising, because like, it's funny. Um, the Humane League and MFA spend about as much per month on just Facebook ads as our entire budget for the year, just on Facebook ads. That's it. You know, so all of our op all of our operations can be, you know, can be bundled up into one month of Facebook advertising for some of these other nonprofit organizations, but they have anywhere from 30 to 1,000 times more money than we do. So, um, But because we don't have the ability to sponsor content, we rely on other pages a lot. Um, 
and then look at the analytics and debrief afterwards. Like the video did well, if it didn't do well, you can look at the YouTube video and you can see like how much your audience dropped off at various times. Facebook has the same graph where you can see like how much of your audience you're retaining over time. So every single video I make, I always look at the analytics afterwards and see how long are people watching, what parts of the video do they like most, and so on. Okay, any other questions for me? Yeah. Uh, that clip at the end was pretty um, abnormal, I would say, for like an open rescue type of video. Yeah. Is there a reason why you chose this one to kind of include something like that? <sighs> no, I don't know. I mean, it just it just fit with the storyline, <laughs> and it, maybe it's it's honestly maybe a little arbitrary, and I don't even know if this is the right storyline. I mean, I think at this time, I don't. Know, I mean, we've been trying to do a better job of integrating our activism and showing that open rescue and protests are related. So, you know, showing at least a little bit of a protest clip seemed valuable for this one. But yeah, there is, there's no particular reason. Okay. What did you think of it? Um, good. Think it was I've, good. I've heard criticism from other people. I think it was good to have it okay. for that reason. Yeah. Yeah, it's like a, a bit of a call to action, too, in a way. It's like, oh, this is what you do after the Yeah, you go out in the streets, streets yeah. and raise your voice. It's a nice image. Yeah. yeah. It's just, there's something about the, the march, the face, the, the quality of the video footage. It's just like with our top 4K video cameras. So it's just, I don't know, I just thought that was a really good scene. And then also just what, what, what's being chanted, too. I mean, if you listen, what's... Animals feel fear. Just like us. Like that's just that's the message of the video. I mean, Scarlett feels fear. I mean, just look at her. She's scared. She's huddling and she wants to get out of here, and it's not right. Like, why does she have to feel fear her entire life? That's not fair to anybody. Like, no one should feel that sort of terror their entire lives. And so many animals endure this their entire lives. This sort of like intense, just not just you know, oh, I'm a little anxious, but like, holy shit, I could get eaten alive at any point. Like, I'm scared for my life. I could get pecked, trampled. Every single moment of my life, I'm looking out for my basic safety, because at any point I could get stomped on the head, my eye could get pecked out, I could be cannibalized. And no one deserves to feel that sort of fear. Yeah? How did you come up with the structure? For this video? For you general of this. Um, yeah, you mean the general structure for a lot of these videos? Mm -hmm. I just watched other, like, the Dodo clips, mm -hmm. and, and I just thought about, like, what stories that I like watching. Um, and honestly, like, the, the same structure I use, if you read it in my blog posts about rescues, my blog posts have the same structure. Okay. Um, you know, I've been reading and writing stories my entire life, and it's funny because I didn't start video editing until 2015. You know, DXE started in 2013 for the first year I did almost no, no, actually I think it was 2014. So yeah, I started video editing in 2014 because I did a lot of protest videos. It might have even been in the end of 2013. Actually, it might have been the middle of 2013. But the first six months to a year, I did not do any video editing. I didn't even know I had any video editing skill. And I was pressed into video editing by necessity because there was a day of action video where our video editor dropped the ball. And literally the night before, like he just said, like, ah, I don't feel like doing this. I'm like, what do you mean you don't feel like doing this? We, he announced to everyone we're going to release the video tomorrow. And so I just like got pressed into learning Final Cut Pro in one night and trying to pop out a video. Uh, and the video I made was called Love is Action. It's actually a decent video. Like, it's not good by my current standards, but I kind of liked it. And I it just, I realized that I loved doing it because like, I thought it was going to be a chore, and instead it was like super exciting and fun for me to spend. I basically stayed up all night, and I started videoing at eight, and we released it at like ten p.m. the next morning because I just didn't sleep and worked for fourteen hours straight. Um, I had had some basic video editing experience before then; I knew the tools at least, but I didn't know I had the conceptual and kind of storytelling tools to be able to tell a good visual story. Um, but I think what I've learned is that a lot of great directors, executive producers, and scriptwriters start out as writers. They're just good at telling stories in written form. And so just reading a lot of good stories is important. Um, and I've been writing fiction since I was like 10 years old, you know, the first time I had an opportunity to write a story. And it's for a long time I thought it was my main role in the animal rights movement, just writing cute stories about animals. I mean, I'm still working on a novel, which probably will never get published. But. So just I've thought a lot about stories. I've read a lot of stories. I'm super picky about stories. I don't like most movies, don't like most fiction, and they're, they're just certain things like – they're just certain, like whenever you see, a, whenever, so one thing I think I really encourage people to do is when you read a good story or you watch a movie and there's a part of the movie that you really like, think about, stop for a moment and think about why you liked it and think about recreating it. So I'll give an example. I was watching Moana recently um, 
And it's an amazing movie, first of all, and there's like great music. But there's a couple scenes in that movie that just really powerfully struck me. One of them is when Moana's eating some pork, and, um, and there's a, a baby piglet next to her, and she looks and she's like, her eyes get really big, and she realizes she's eating pork, and she apologizes and runs out. And like, that moment of recognition, that transition was really powerful for me, and recreating that in a video was something I wanted to do. Another moment that was really powerful in the movie was when the same baby piglet like falls in the water and she's drowning and Moana like risks her own life. She realizes like I'm in danger. I could die. This water is way too scary for me, but I'm gonna just jump off this boat, dive in the water, and save this baby piglet, and then endanger myself. Because she ends up getting stuck. Like she almost drowns to death trying to save this baby piglet. So the story arc of like this this girl who's eating pork sees this piglet and it's a shame because she's like realizes, oh this baby piglet's my friend. I forget her name. The piglet the piglet has a name in Moana. And then she goes from eating pork, feeling ashamed, to having this piglet in a boat with her. The piglet falls in the water in this really dangerous water, and she's risking her life for it. She goes from eating pork to risking her life. And that transition was really powerful. I cried at that moment. Like, I was like, I was in tears. I was, it was so powerful for me. And then just, you know, steal that, copy that entirely. Like, when you see a story arc that's really powerful to you, try to simulate it in an open rescue video. Because it worked for Moana and made like, you know, eight hundred million dollars for Disney and Pixar. It's probably going to work for social media too. So another thing that I learned from some great writer, and I forgot who which writer said this, but um, there's some great writer who says there there are no great creators; they're only great thieves. That every great writer in history has basically stolen a bunch of other ideas from all the reading they've done, all the stories they've heard. They just like put those pieces together and create a new story that's also powerful. So like, be unapologetic about stealing great scenes. So. Go and watch lots of, I don't watch a lot of movies, but I, I do read a lot of stories still. Like I'm constantly reading stories and I still do watch a lot of videos and usually I hate them. <laughs> and when I like them, I know there's something there that I really would like to use. Okay, any other questions? Okay, was that helpful for folks? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, you know, I mean, I'd love for other folks to like take the checklist that I've created and the checklist has all this documentation on the side, so if like, there's an action item on the checklist you don't understand, just go to the right-hand side column and click on the link, and it'll spell things out a little bit more. Like, if you see, you know, think about a concept that invokes steps, and you don't understand what steps is. Like, obviously, most people are not going to understand what steps is, because it's an acronym, and there'll be an article that spells out in more detail what does steps mean. And really, like, when you're making videos, go through this checklist and make sure you're covering all these points, because if you're not covering all these points, in some way, your video, your video is not going to be as good as it could be. Okay, so that was a lot longer than I expected. I was hoping it would be 30 minutes and ended up being an hour and 20 minutes. Um, as you can tell, I'm passionate about video editing. I really like it. Um, honestly, if like if I didn't have all these other responsibilities, probably the two things I do all day is take care of animals because I love animal care, and the second thing is probably video edit it. But you know, we have other responsibilities. So hopefully, we have future occasions to talk about this because I'm really passionate about it. And when you're passionate about something, you like talking to other people about it. So. If any of you also become really passionate about it, I think everybody in this room um, who's made a video has done really great work in the past. Like Kat, you made a really great video of like the cattle disruption thing. Um, Corey, let that video you made at the local butcher shop was awesome. So like, you probably have had the same experience of just enjoying the crafts, right? Like yeah. working on it, it's like not coming together at first. You're like, what do I do? And then you can see the vision starting to materialize, and then the final product is like is amazing, and you're really happy with it. That's super empowering, but it's even more incredible to share that experience with others. And I hope we can continue doing that, not just with video editing, frankly, with all the work we do. Like really just enjoying our craft, refining it, getting better at it, and sharing what we learn, the passion we have for our craft with the people around you. Because you're working with people who are also passionate about what they do, it makes you more passionate too. So I really enjoyed this in our 20 minutes. It was longer than I expected, and hopefully, maybe sometime soon, one of you will be able to do the same workshop. Okay? Cool. All right, I am going to close this. Way that you walk through the structure, you know, like for me so far, each video I just kind of like make it up as I go. Like I don't yeah. come up with the script or anything, and that's I think that'll be like, come up with the script and then like make everything else follow that. Whereas I, I normally just come up with the video and like try to like I always feel the urge to do at least chronologically too. Yeah. Necessarily yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. I, I think the storyboard is really important. And, um, another great artist, and I apologize for not being able to recall these people's names. I know there's some great artist who says that um, creativity comes from structure. It doesn't come from like anarchy. Like you need some structure in place initially to like play off of. Um, and I think that's very true. That 
if you don't have some structure, an outline, or something for you to, because creativity with no structure just goes in a thousand different directions and isn't true creativity, it's just chaos. Like creativity comes from having some skeleton in place that you can play off of. And the same is true like when, when great musicians are like riffing off of each other and they're great, they, they, you know, they're improvising, they usually have some base skeletal structure. Like and at a minimum, they have some basic understanding of, of theories of music and like what music is like, you know, music should have bars, it should operate in certain keys. And they have some structure in place that they can exert their creativity on. And I think the same is true of video. Editing. Okay, any other questions, thoughts? Okay, great. Then I will shut down the broadcast. Goodbye, everyone on the live stream. We have two viewers. Hopefully you found it interesting. If you didn't, I apologize. And we'll see you next time. We're going to stop the broadcast. Bye, everybody.